welcome our brethren that are watching online. I think several of the churches up north are not able to have services today because of the weather. So I understand we have several um, that are joining us. We're, we're glad they're here. <clears throat> and we're glad we live in Florida, aren't we? <laughs> <clears throat> Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That word boldly means with confidence. God say unto you and I, if you're looking to Christ as your priest before God, you can come with confidence into the very presence of God to receive mercy and grace in your time of need. I wonder how many of us are needy this morning. Needy. I'm not talking about you got a shortfall on your finances. I'm talking about a need to have your sin put away. A need to have the hope and assurance of salvation. What a, what a heavy burden that is if God puts it on your soul. And the only, the only one to relieve it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let's stand together. Bert's going to come lead us. On the hymn on the back of your bulletin. It is finished, sinners hear it, tis the dying victor's cry. It is finished, angels bear it, bear the joyful fruit on high. It is finished, it is finished, tell it through the earth and sky. Justice from her awful station bars the sinner peace no more justice fused with approbation what the Savior did and bore grace and mercy grace and mercy now display their boundless store hear the
matchless name. If you would uh, turn with me, please, in God's Word to Luke chapter 19. When we meet in the uh, young people's class Bible study, we start every class by asking, what's this book, the Bible, all about? And we finally, through repetition, they understand this is a book about Christ and how he saves sinners. So when we read these passages, we ask ourselves, what does this tell me about Christ and how he saves sinners? Zacchaeus has just come down from the tree and the Lord has met with him. And all the religious ask, how could he eat with a sinner? But aren't we glad he does? <laughs> We're so glad. We'll start in verse 10. The Lord told them, he said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. They thought that his kingdom was an earthly kingdom, and they would be the beneficiary of that earthly kingdom. But that We know that's not true. And here's the parable, verse 12. He said, Therefore a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. This is Christ. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. And verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man reign or rule over us. And that is the cry of every child of Adam and Eve. And if you say, well, I've never said that, then my fear is just because you're still saying it. We will not have Christ rule over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. I believe this money is the gospel. It's the gospel. God had given them the light of the gospel and left. And now he's returned. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And the Lord said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thou, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise to him, be thou over also five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. It's the bushel over the candlelight, isn't it? For I feared thee. Because thou art an austere man. That's a strict man. Another gospel says a hard man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down. And thou reapest that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him. Out of your own mouth will I judge you. Thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man. Taking up that I laid not down. And reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then thou givest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have at least required my own with usury. If you just put it in the bank, I'd have got something. But you did nothing with what I gave you. And he said, and then stood by, Take from him that pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds already. God's already told us the gospel to those who have Share the beauty of the gospel with others. He's going to take it from those who do not love it and give it to those who do. 
And I say unto you, that every one which hath shall be given from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. And here's verse 27 I want us to see. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, these people that did not want me to reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Even if you're sitting here as a believer this morning, there was a time when you said, I will not have this man reign over me. But aren't we glad that the king and the ruler reigns over us? And there was a day in his power that he made you and I willing. And we said, oh, Lord, come now, reign over me, rule over me. And that's the prayer of every believer, that God, we're so thankful that Christ reigns and that all the events of our lives are in his hands. And I could speak, every believer says, I'm glad I'm there. Lord, that's where I want to be. I want to be in your hands. I don't want to make my decision because they're always wrong and they always lead to destruction and death. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, we've gathered here this morning confessing that, Lord, we are guilty sinners and pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning, that you would cause us by your Spirit to submit to you, to rest and to believe on you and in you. Lord, that we would be glad that you rule over us as our king and ruler. And please that you would squash any thoughts we may have of wanting to rule for ourselves, for they are foolish and they are evil. We pray for those who are gathered, Lord, that you might be pleased to bring your lost sheep home today. And Lord, that you would enable us to follow after you and plead with you, Lord, save us, save us this day. And that we would look to you and live. We ask it for your glory. Amen. We're going to sing to him number 340. Number 340, if you could please stand.
felt forsaken by God. It's a horrible feeling. But if you're a child of God, it's just that, a feeling. Feelings come and feelings go. Feelings are deceiving. My only warrant is the word of God. None else is worth believing. I will never leave you or forsake you. David said, I was young and now I am old and I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging bread. And the only hope that you and I have, the only hope that you and I have, that God will never forsake us, is that he did truly forsake the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 22. This wasn't a feeling. Oh, it... it, Oh, it was a feeling. It went to the depths of his soul. But this feeling was based on truth. For God Almighty, when he saw sin on his own son, was forced by his holy justice to forsake him. When the Lord Jesus Christ cried on Calvary's cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He wasn't saying, well, you know, it seems like God has forsaken me, but I know he hasn't. When the sky was blackened and the presence of God was completely absent from the Lord Jesus Christ, it was more than a feeling. Why did God forsake Christ? Christ, forsaken of God. He died on a cross alone. Now you and I have very little understanding of what that means. We, we, we go in and out 
of our communion with God. If you're a believer, if the Lord's never been pleased to make himself known to you, then you've never experienced his presence at all. But if you're a child of God, you have the experience of going in and out of fellowship with him. Sometimes you feel his presence very near. Other times you feel forsaken by him. And, and in those times when he withdraws the awareness of his presence, he puts into your heart a desire to draw near to him again. The Lord Jesus Christ, here's what we can't understand. Here's what we, this is the mystery of the gospel. And yet we know it's true because God's words declares it to be true. The Lord Jesus Christ for all eternity, for all eternity, had had nothing but perfect bliss in his relationship with his father. The best experience we've ever had in in communion with the Lord does not even begin to compare what he knew in his relationship with the father. And yet when he went to Calvary's cross, he was forsaken of God. It is the cup that he asked the Lord, if there be any other way that this cup can pass from me, let it be. He wasn't talking about, well, there were two men right there on his right and his left that were suffering the same physical suffering that he was suffering in terms of crucifixion. The bitter dregs of God's wrath that he would drink to its bitter end. The separation that he would have with the Father on Calvary's cross was real. It was real. Some have suggested that, well, you know, it was just a a, a legal thing. It was just something that God had to do in order to in order to put the sins of his people away. And that it was that it was very objective but not subjective in terms of the Lord's feelings. It's not what the scriptures teach. Look look at me. Look with me. I want us to look at, at three things about the forsaking of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. This is not an original outline. Many gospel preachers have preached this simple three-point outline. This is the first time I ever have, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. The reality of Christ being forsaken. The reason for Christ being forsaken and the results of Christ being forsaken. The reality, the reason, and the results of God Almighty forsaking the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. And we know that David was a man after God's own heart. And the scriptures in Acts chapter 2, when Paul, when, when Peter, I'm sorry, preached the first gospel message there in Jerusalem as the church on the day of Pentecost, David spends, uh, uh, Peter, I'm sorry, spends a lot of time in that message quoting David. And here's what he says about David in Acts chapter 2, verse 25. David speaking concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. David knew when he wrote Psalm 22 that he wasn't writing about himself. He knew that he was being inspired by the Spirit of God to write about the Christ, the Messiah, the son of David, the one who would come that David was only a type of. He was the sweet psalmist of Israel. He was, the, he was a man after God's own heart. He was the king. He was the, the shepherd of Israel. But in all those things, he only, he only foreshadows what would be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter makes it clear in quoting from Psalm 16 that David knew what he was saying. He knew that he was talking not about himself. He was talking about Christ. Now I've, 
I've made this statement before and I'll make it again. This goes along with what we looked at in the first hour. Every word in this book, as you said, Michael, points us to Christ. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I, I, I get so frustrated in reading commentaries and hearing men who talk about messianic psalms. And of course, Psalm 22 would be agreed on by everyone that this is a messianic psalm. Every psalm is messianic, as is every chapter in this glorious book. It all points to Christ. But even an unbeliever can see that Psalm 22 speaks in such glorious detail about exactly what happened on Calvary's cross, but they don't enter in in faith to the reality of what the Lord Jesus Christ was experiencing, the reason why he was experiencing, and the result of what he experienced. And that's what I hope we'll be able to enter into, that God the Holy Spirit will enable us to believe that what the Lord Jesus Christ suffered on Calvary's cross was real to him. That the Father wasn't saying to him, well, you know, I know these aren't yours. I mean, we know they weren't. They were. This is all about substitution. People say, well, you know, if you, if you impute the sins of God's people to Christ, then you defile the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, there are people who say that. And so they make this imputation nothing more than a, than a legal thing that, that took place in heaven. It's not what the scripture teaches. Look what he says. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime. But thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. Yes, we have a high priest who is able to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He bore in his body the sins of his people. Yet he himself, yet he himself was without sin. But never do we hear him say, well, God, you know that I'm that these aren't really mine. You know that I'm just that I'm just I like what Scott Richardson said. He said the 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 imputation of sin on the sin bearer, on the substitute, is not a pasted on imputation. And every word that we hear from God's word, the reality of what the Lord Jesus Christ went through was that he felt. You know, what, you know what guilt and shame feels like? You do, don't you? And yet it's what you and I experience when we experience guilt and shame is so slight. And it lasts for such a short period of time, doesn't it? We get over it pretty quick, don't we? We move on pretty quickly. And what we experience, it doesn't, doesn't go too deep, does it? The Lord Jesus Christ experienced the reality of shame and guilt to its infinite degree. He he knew by experience how evil sin really was. Sin doesn't bother us too much. It really doesn't. Not when we compare how it affected him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken? Lord, I cry, my roarings go out. Now we know that he was without sin himself. This, the, the God Almighty spoke audibly from heaven on at least two occasions, maybe three, and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The Lord Jesus Christ said of himself, he said, I always do the will of the Father. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And he himself was able to say to his enemies, which of you 
can convince me of sin. Now, who of us can do that? Who of us can stand publicly and say, anybody here? Can you expose anything wrong with me? That's what the Lord was saying. Truth is, if you knew me, all you would have to say about me is that he's a sinner. (laughs) Everything about him is sinful. But the Lord Jesus Christ was the holy, harmless, undefiled son of God who lived his life in absolute perfect obedience until he went to Calvary's cross. And then he bore in his body the sins of his people. And he experienced the shame and guilt of sin to the depths of hell. Forsaken of God. Like you and I have never known it. Turn with me to Psalm 40. Now we know that Psalm 40 is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's quoted in Hebrews chapter 10. Look what he says in verse 7. Then said I, lo... I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. He made the law of God honorable. He obeyed it perfectly from the very depths of his soul. In every thought, in every word, in every deed, he kept the law of God, to the inspection of God Almighty. And God was pleased with him. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have refrained my lips, O Lord. I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have presented myself to my people as the only hope of their righteousness. And I've done it without reservation. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. I've made it clear to men that though they go about to establish their own righteousness, they do it because they're ignorant of the righteousness of God. I've made it clear to my church that I am the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. I've done that. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. Now he's calling on the Father based on his obedience. He's calling on God Almighty based on his obedience to preserve him and to reward him for his faithfulness. For innumerable evils have come past me about. I was talking to somebody about this passage of scripture recently. And and I asked him about this verse. And they said, well, undeniably those verses you just read refer to Christ. But now David's speaking of himself. And I read the Bible bifocally. That's what he said. I read it with bi- I've got bifocals on. I understand what it means to see something bifocally. You look through the top and you see one thing. You look. He said, I read the Bible bivo- bifocally. In other words, he was saying, well, David was talking about Christ in verse 11. And he was talking about Christ at the first part of verse 12. For innumerable evils have come past me about. But now... After the semicolon or colon, he changes to talk about David. How foolish is that? Well, I'm, this is the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ being forsaken. That your sins became him, became his so really that he owned them for his own. And suffered and died to put them away. For innumerable evils have come past me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. He couldn't look up to the Father. 
The father was nowhere to be found. He showed him no mercy. There was no grace. He was completely unlike you and I have ever experienced. The Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross was completely forsaken by God. That's the reality of the crucifixion. And that's all you need to know about your sin. Is that when God saw it on his own darling son. He was forced by his holy nature to completely forsake him. And now the Lord Jesus Christ is crying out. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Notice that the Lord Jesus Christ could not, there's, he could not call on God as his father. Any other place where we see the Lord praying, he's praying to his father. But having been forsaken by God, all he could do is refer to him as God. His union, his relationship, his, his fellowship with God Almighty had been severed. And he cries in agony as a result of bearing his sins in our body, my God. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Lamentations is just after Jeremiah. If you want to turn with me there quickly in your Bibles. Lamentations chapter 1. Lamentations chapter 1. Now I want to begin reading in verse 11. All her people sigh. They seek bread. They have given their pleasant things for meat to relieve the soul. See, O Lord, and consider, for I have become vile. Now, there's only one person that can say that. You and I were born vile. When Job, when Job saw his sin, he said, Behold, I am vile. I am vile. Jeremiah is speaking prophetically of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he says, when he says, for I am become vile. The sins of my people have been imputed to me. And now I am something that I wasn't before. This is the reality of our Lord's death. This is the reality of your sin and mine. Look at the next verse. Is it nothing to you all that you pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. This is the wrath of God being poured out from heaven. The fierceness of his anger, his justice being satisfied, God Almighty is punishing the Lord Jesus Christ for the sins of his people. From above hath he sent fire into my bones, and it prevailed against them. He hath spread a net for my feet. He hath turned me back. He hath made me desolate and faint all the day. The yoke of my transgressions is bound by my hand. And they are wreathed and come up upon my neck. He hath made my strength to fall. The Lord hath delivered me into their hand. For I am not able to rise up. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The reality of the Lord Jesus Christ being forsaken. The Lord hath trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me. He hath called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord hath trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, and in the winepress. Everyone scattered. Left him all by himself. He had no comfort from his disciples, no comfort from his people, no comfort from God. He was cut off 
suspended between heaven and earth all by himself. The reality of what the Lord Jesus Christ suffered on. And listen, it's as I've said, we can't appreciate, we, we, can't, we can't enter into this experientially. Oh, but that God would give us the faith to believe it's true. To believe it. Lord, whatever all that means, I know it's true. For these things I weep, mine eye, mine eye runneth down with water because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. Zion spreadeth forth his hands, her hands, and there is none to comfort her. The Lord hath commanded concerning Judah, uh, Jacob, I'm sorry, that his adversaries should be round about him. Jerusalem is a menstruous woman among them. Their righteousness is as of filthy rags. The Lord is righteous, for I have rebelled against his commandment. Don't read that with bifocals. Just know that whatever this means, the Lord Jesus Christ has owned the sins of his people. The reality of imputation was so real and so true to the Lord Jesus Christ over and over and over again. He calls your sins and my sins. You see, the justice of God couldn't be satisfied unless they became his. He couldn't offer himself up as a sacrifice for sin if the sins were not, if they were not charged to him, if they were not imputed to him. Which brings us to the second point. The reason why the Lord Jesus Christ was forsaken of God. And I've already mentioned it in my introduction. So that we would never be forsaken. We deserve what he got. Do you believe that about yourself? Do you believe that if God gave you what you deserve, that you would be cast headlong into a devil's hell for all eternity, separated from God, suffering under the wrath of God without any hope, any hope of salvation? If God's made you to be a sinner, you know that's true. And the reason why the Lord Jesus Christ did what he did is because I deserve to be forsaken. I deserve to be separated from God. He did what he did in order to save his people from the wrath that is to come. The angel told Mary, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. People talk about being saved. I never heard that term growing up, what it means to be saved. The first time somebody asked me, I remember I was about 20 years old. First time somebody asked me, are you saved? And my natural response was, save from what? Save from what? I don't know what you're talking about. Now I know. <laughs> Saved from the wrath that is to come. Saved from the judgment of God. Saved from the penalty of death and hell. Oh, I've got to be saved. <laughs> this is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The reason why the Lord Jesus Christ was forsaken by God was to save his people. Are you looking to him as the only hope of your salvation? You see, you, you still have your Bibles open to Lamentations. Look at, look, at verse, look at verse 12. Is it nothing to you that pass by and see me? You know what? It will be one of two things to you. And don't try to find any middle ground. There is none. What we're talking about right now will either be nothing to you or it will be everything to you. 
There's no middle ground. His righteousness became mine. My sin became his. That's why he did it. The reality of it is that he experienced being forsaken of God. He experienced whatever hell means. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ experienced. Now, people want to debate, well, where, where did he go and what did he do during those three days? I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. It's one of those secret things that God's not revealed to his people. But we know that he died. We know that he didn't see corruption. Yeah, I don't know how long it takes for rigor mortis to set in. It never set in his body. Not one cell in his body broke down or began to, began to, 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 to decay. Scripture's clear on that. He's dead. He's dead. Completely dead. Put into a tomb. But God saw his holiness and would not allow his body to see corruption. And in three days, he raised him from the dead, offered up for our offenses, and raised again because of our justification. That's why he did it. That's why he did it. He did it to put away the sins of his people, to justify us before God. <clears throat> God's holy. Look, go, go back with me to our, to our psalm in Psalm 22. Here's the answer. Verse 3 is the answer to the reason why the Lord Jesus Christ was forsaken by God. It's very simple. Right here in verse 3. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. That's why. When a holy God saw sin on his darling son, his eyes were too pure to look upon sin. He had no choice to, but to forsake him. And if he did that for Christ... What do you suppose he's going to do for you or me if he finds one sin on us? If God should mark iniquity, who shall stand? If God judges you or me based on the best thing we've ever done, we're going to hell. Did you hear that? That's the truth of the gospel. It's called grace. We're sinners. It, I will in no means, or by no means, clear the guilty. You and I are guilty. When the Lord Jesus Christ prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, Father, if there be any way this cup can pass from me, let it be. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. There was no other way. There was no other way. He had to drink the bitter dregs of God's wrath. He had to be forsaken of God. He had to die and, 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 and suffer the shame and separation of hell for the judgment of our sin. He had to. He had to do it in order that all scriptures might be fulfilled. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You know, we could... Uh, we could probably draw a big crowd here on Sunday mornings if we just put a sign out on the road there that told folks that we were delving into the secrets of prophecy. We were going to answer the questions that are pressing for the day and what's going to happen in the future. And people love that sort of thing. The, the scripture says the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, is the spirit of of all prophecy. Here's another verse. All the promises of God are yea and amen in him. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ had to be forsaken of God in order to fulfill all prophecy. Oh, we could go through so many prophecies of the Old Testament, beginning with the serpent will bruise the heel 
of the seed of the woman, but he is going to crush his head, destroy the works of the devil, and deliver those who are held captive by him. Oh, what glorious reason the Lord Jesus Christ had. He did it in order to glorify God. And what glory he brought to God. He showed the justice of God in suffering, being forsaken of God because of the holiness of God. We see something about the evil of our sin. Your conscience and whatever consequences you suffer for bad behavior is not conviction of sin. Unbelievers have a conscience. Unbelievers will feel bad when they do something wrong. All men have the law of God written on their hearts. It's called worldly sorrow, which leadeth to death. Godly sorrow now, which leadeth to repentance is to look upon the one whom thou hast pierced and sorrow for him as a father sorroweth after his only son. It's having some understanding that what the Lord... In other words, what I'm telling you is you want to to see something in truth about your sin, look to Christ hanging on Calvary's cross and know that that was the only thing that God would be satisfied with in putting your sin away. That's how evil it was. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Father, my hour is now come. Glorify thy son as I have glorified thee upon the earth. And the Lord Jesus Christ did what he did in order to bring glory to God. He was doing business with God. He was upholding the justice and the righteousness and the holiness and the, and, and the, the, the power of God. The most powerful thing that ever has taken place on the face of this earth is what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished on Calvary's cross. The putting away of our sin the satisfying of divine justice, the pleasure of the Father. What great power. That's why he did it. He did it in order to exalt the grace and mercy of God. The scripture says that in in Psalm 85 verse 10, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That's what happened. God was able to be just And justify sinners because the Lord Jesus Christ was forsaken on Calvary's cross. And so we have the mercy of God and the truth of God. We have the righteousness of God and the peace of God. These things are contrary without the cross. They cannot be brought together without the cross. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ did what he did. The reality... Of the Lord Jesus Christ being forsaken by God. Is that he suffered separation by the Father. To the depths of his soul. In a way that you and I have never known it. The reason why he did it. Was to glorify the Father. And to put away our sin. You want to know something about the love of God? Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Here's a mystery of the gospel. How are you going to get a hold of the fact that God loves you with an everlasting love? Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God? Having loved his own, the scripture says he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. That's the reason he did it. For God so loved the world. Worldlings. Worldlings. Folks outside of Israel. Gentile dogs. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the reason he did it. And the result, the result 
is that we have the righteousness of God. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who knew no sin to be sin. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. <laughs> How are you going to stand in the presence of a holy God? You're going to have to be perfect. You have to be perfect. Turn, turn with me to um, Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Here's what the scripture says. This is not Hebrews chapter 5, but here's, here's well, let's read Hebrews 5, 5 at verse 7. Look at verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh... When he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Now, the Lord was a man of prayers. It'd be, oftentimes we see in the scripture that he separated himself from the disciples, went into a mountain and prayed. He prayed to the Father. But oh, never did he pray like this. Hear, hear his prayer of agony. He's crying out to the Father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? These are the cryings with tears unto him that was able to save. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them you see that word obey? It's the same word as belief. All them that believe on him. All them that trust him. All them that obey him. That look to him. That rely upon him for their righteousness before God. What is the result? The justice of God is satisfied. The righteousness of God is fulfilled. By one offering, by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I can stand perfect in the presence of a holy God because of what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished on Calvary's cross. Again, I close with Lamentations chapter 1. Is it nothing to you that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherein the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. The Lord Jesus Christ being forsaken of God will be everything to you and me or nothing. There's no middle ground. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would open the eyes of our understanding, that you would give to us faith. Father, that that we would believe the declaration of thy word and rest in the accomplished work of thy dear son. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. 118 in the hardback hymn. Now let's stand together.